this is just uh, so over the top, the best, you know, the best example, best in class example of how to manage a pandemic. This approach is teachable. This is a method. There's a science to it. The other thing I want to point out uh, that really jumps out at me, I'm a physician. I worked in a tertiary care center. This is a public health approach. This is a public health population health approach, which means you're more your focus priority is keeping your people healthy, keeping the healthy people healthy, and particularly keeping your providers healthy or your EMTs or your firemen healthy so that they can take care of other people. And this is the 60% solution. It's like the battlefield solution. You, you move forward on the best information you have at the time to protect the most people, to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. He emphasized several principles. One we call in public health and environmental health, a precautionary principle, which is basically what he has been saying, what I just said. You, you don't wait for 100% proven evidence. You operate with the best evidence you have to protect public health. The other thing that, that this wonderful instrument has allowed them to do is something that is part of a CDC recommendation, but I feel like has been the Cinderella stepsister of the CDC, this whole pandemic, there's actually a national institute embedded in the CDC called the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Their principle is embodied in one image, which I can, I can uh, share in the recorded version, and it's called the hierarchy of controls. You protect individuals with personal protective equipment, but you do a better job if you can protect their environment. Keep the workplace safe, which is what the chief has done in spades, with, and particularly with being able to monitor it with this fantastic technology. You make it so that people are not scared to come to work because they know their workplace is maybe the safest place in the community. That should be the case for our hospitals, our fire stations, but also our grocery stores and our travel um, uh, uh, our travel uh, locations where people catch public transit and within public transit and within ambulances. Those, should, those environments should be able to be tested and to be kept safe during a pandemic. This is not over. And, you know, it, it's great that we are turned a corner and we're in a good place within this pandemic. But meanwhile, the variants are multiplying around the world and people are continuing to travel. This, this is not over. And to, to partner this with the flu vaccine program in the fall, I think is fantastic. And the chief has explained very well how you, how you train your population, you educate them, you train them, you reassure them with the process of coming to key places to get tested, to get information, and then to get vaccinated or to wear their mask. Um, as, as needed going forward. You know, I see a, a tremendous opening for uh, regional education and, and partnering on this between the, the schools and, uh, and, and the, the first responders, the fire departments and the hospitals for future planning. Uh, and the other thing I wanna point out is that this was an airborne virus that was not really emphasized as an airborne virus by many of our official groups, namely CDC and WHO until really fairly recently, but a tremendous number of other viruses and, and, and problem actors are airborne, mold, flu, you know, many other diseases, uh, uh, Legionnaire's disease, TB, measles, some of these things that are making a comeback because people haven't gotten regular immunizations. The technology and workflow looked very reasonable um, for a fire department to handle. And I think that that was part of my initial concern is how complicated is this going to be? Um, you know, not one person can do this. And uh, the workflow that was worked out and the, the size of the machine, as you'll see, was very, very doable for us. We used the hallway here at the, the main fire station. Um, we have a first aid testing room. We put it directly across from that. And it's also kind of the main hallway for people coming in and out of the building. So it was a high volume uh, traffic area for, for both uh, municipal employees and then vendors um, that were coming in and out of the building. And the concerns was how would data be utilized and, and who would be the reporting person for that, who'd be the, the gateway, the gatekeeper 
uh, for that information. So we worked that out with the unions ahead of time. And, and they realized, I think, going in that this was a this was a positive thing. Um, remember, we were transporting at the time, we get into the December, January timeframe, eight to nine patients a day, COVID positive, Sandwich Fire Department was transporting. So these um, workers and employees here were around COVID um, eight, nine, 10 times a day. That's just transporting patients. And then you're in the hospital, you're in nursing homes. And then the thought was, am I bringing this home to my family? So having the device here was a nice uh, additional add-on, I think, for the employees to know. And it also provided me with the ability to, to make sure that the mandated masking policy here at the station was adhered to. Um, so the results of the, of the 30 sample run were 28 negative runs. The interesting part was we had two positive hits on December 30th and on New Year's Day. The employee in question um, admitted they did not wear a mask while working. Um, and uh, because of the holiday, because the administrative offices here were, uh, most people were on vacation, um, you know, they felt the exposure risk was minimal and they did not wear the mask. So when the dates were identified, the same working group had worked both days. All staff uh, that were in the building at that time frame were rapid antigen tested um, and they were tested daily for seven days. They were also PCR tested on day five and seven. All employees working those two shifts were negative with the exception of the positive employee. Again, the employee stated they didn't have the mask on for the majority of the time. Uh, they were working in and around the machine in the first aid room uh, doing cleaning and other stuff. So they were in the, in the vicinity of the machine without their mask. Um, and they did say December 30th and January 1st that they felt off, but there was no fever, um, no significant symptomology, just they felt a little bit off and, and the symptoms really accelerated on the 3rd of January. Um, and when they showed up here on the 4th, there was loss of taste and smell and a, and a fever, uh, which again was confirmed with the rapid antigen and the nasal PCR test. We confirmed the positive employee on the 6th of January with a positive nasal, nasal PCR test. Uh, we were so pleased with the beta, um, you know, tests that we did and, and how it worked. And, and, uh, and I should mention also that the machine uh, was moved around um, on January the 8th. We did um, public safety vaccinations for the entire Upper Cape region, uh, approximately four to 500 first responders. We were able to take the, the thermo uh, scientific machine to our vaccination site and run it for that period of time. What we're doing with the machine now is we're doing passive surveillance. And I think one of the mistakes made last year is people got very lax over the summer. And we actually ramped things up here with aggressive purchasing of supplies and setting up for uh, what our testing protocols and flu vaccines would look like. So right now we're gonna run some passive surveillance with the machine. Uh, this summer. And then the plan is to ramp up to daily testing um, through, through those peak periods. We, we consider November to February. Uh, we'll see how that goes, uh, but we will move it around. And the hotspot location. So one of the things that um, is good about the machine is like voting, right? So the elections this past year were, you know, one of the largest attended uh, voting elections in, in, in recent history. Having a machine like this at, a, at one of our primary polling areas, you have built-in uh, contact tracing when, when you have voting because um, they are checking in. So our plan is to run it um, for the fall elections, which are on a smaller scale here in the Commonwealth and, and locally. We are going to run the, uh, the aerosol sense sampler at our uh, voting precinct to see if we get any hits. We were lucky here in Sandwich that our public health nurse and town um, health director and I had all worked together since 2008 on uh, drive-through flu clinics. And we were able to pivot pretty, uh, pretty easily to the, the COVID-19 response. You have to be able to show that you're aggressive in, in doing that. As long as there's no harm and you're able to move the needle forward, I think that was our strategy from the beginning. And, and again, having town employees and municipal employees, you know, 500 municipal employees comfortable coming to work in the town of Sandwich especially in the peak of the pandemic when a lot of communities still aren't even open yet and they're doing online and remote hours. I think having that was extremely helpful. Um, and I'm very proud of the, uh, of the work that the town did. Um, uh, very appreciative again of the private sector support that we had. And, and this is not over. 
and it's going to pop up here and there. It's going to be pretty much a permanent part of our response matrix here at the fire department. The month of June in the tax collector's office is the busiest throughput of citizens in the town of Sandwich. The machine will go and sit at the town uh, tax collector's office for the month of June um, just to monitor because of the amount of people. The fire department has, uh, you know, we're mainly vaccinated here. 95% of my employees are vaccinated. So we have the flexibility to move the machine around a little bit. And once we get more comfortable with it, then you buy another one, you buy another one, and you put it in these high throughput municipal buildings. And, and again, having the capability to monitor. And then it's all well and good until you get a positive. And this is part of the problem. If you don't work out ahead of time what your plan is for a positive hit and what structured steps you're going to take, it's a waste because you're playing catch up from the beginning. But if you know with an aggressive testing platform, if we get a positive through contact tracing, these are the steps we're going to take, and people know what those steps are that work in those buildings, then I think you have a seamless transition for, for placement of these devices in these municipal buildings.